No better way to get some hate in the comment section going than giving you some sell high candidates. Just to recap what we had last week. Last week, DJ Moore, Justin Fields were sell high candidates for us. Now, were we predicting a Justin Fields injury? Of course we weren't. We were just looking at fantasy points over expectation. We were looking at the schedule that these guys had. We're saying, okay, it's most likely going to get much tougher. The efficiency is probably going to be coming down. And the clear sell high guys. Now, can you sell them high? Probably not. Yeah, Fields injured. DJ Moore value has already plummeted, so it's probably not the time to do so. DK Metcalf, our next guy. We'll talk about DK Metcalf later in this video, so we'll tease you with that. Sam Laporta, we were saying to go through and sell for either Mark Andrews or TJ Hawkinson if you could, because Amon Ross St. Brown coming in, Amon Ross St. Brown was going to dominate targets. Y'all know he was our number one buy low last week. And yeah, Amandra St. Brown came in, dominated. Sam Laporta still looked very good. And I still have Sam Laporta ranked as our tight end for rest of season, just like I did a week ago. It's just when I stream every single night, I kind of see what these guys are going for, right? And I'm seeing that a lot of people would rather have Laporta over Hawkinson right now, which is in my mind is ludicrous. And then our last guy we talked about last week was DeAndre Hopkins. With Hopkins, we are looking at the fact that he was getting volume, but very inefficient with said volume. And more importantly, that the Tennessee Titans offense just projected out to be one of the worst offenses in the NFL. And yeah, Hopkins, not great. I mean, he's not going to be able to be a repeat guest here because, I mean, ultimately, you can no longer sell Hopkins. Nobody's buying. But someone you may be able to get to buy will be Jamison Williams. With Jamison Williams, this is a wide receiver that I drafted in a ton of underdog best ball drafts. Like I was going out there saying, oh, okay, I mean, yeah, he'll come back at some point this season. We know he is that field stretching option that in best ball could be very valuable because we know he profiles to have long receiving touchdowns. Now, when those will come, I have no idea, but in underdog best ball drafts, you don't have to guess when they're going to come. When they do, he'll just naturally slide into your starting lineup. So I really like that profile of a receiver in best ball. However, in our regular redraft shallow league, I know a lot of people watching this are playing in like a 10 team format where you start two wide receivers and one flex. Will you ever be able to go out there and start Jamison Williams week in and week out and know you're going to get top 20 production? In reality, no. The issue with Jamison Williams is kind of that same thing that we were talking about with his strength at best ball. You're the deep threat field stretching option in the Detroit Lions offense. Your primary job in this offense is going to be to stretch NFL defenses to keep two, three safeties back to make sure that defensive coordinators have to play a little bit more conservative and create separation and create space underneath for the running backs for a Monroe St. Brown for Sam Laporta in making the overall offense just more efficient. I think Jamison Williams can be very effective at that role. However, in that role, you're not getting a lot of target volume. I mean, this role, we've seen very, very few wide receivers be fantasy viable over the course of years. The one guy that was able to do it effectively year in and year out was Deshaun Jackson. Everybody always tries chasing the next Deshaun Jackson with that speed over the top. In reality, he's a one of a kind. He is an outlier type player. Jamison will be a very good real life receiver, just not in fantasy. So if we can take him with maybe another player on this list and use him as a trade piece just to go get an upgrade somewhere else that we would like, I think it'd make a lot of sense. Now, I know our next wide receiver people are going to hate us talking about. I got to bring up Jacoby Myers, though. Everybody is in full-blown panic when it comes to Devontae Adams. And yeah, Myers has looked better than Devontae Adams at times this year. I mean, these wide receivers are back-to-back -back in overall points per game. But nonetheless, if you are looking at the difference between these two players, Jacoby Myers is more so doing it off of efficiency with his targets, whereas Devontae Adams is doing it with raw volume. Devontae Adams is still, I believe, like the wide receiver six, wide receiver seven, and overall targets this season, whereas Jacoby Myers is thriving off a touchdown rate that's almost hovering at about 10%. He's had four touchdowns off of 43 targets, which, yeah, you really like from a fantasy football perspective when you're starting the guy. But when you're projecting out, it's very difficult to project out this type of touchdown efficiency. It would be different if this is a wide receiver where we have seen that touchdown efficiency season after season after season. I mean, maybe a good example of someone that we have seen it from year in and year out would be a player like Mike Evans, right? We can safely say that Mike Evans will have a touchdown rate that's probably higher than league average based off the large sample that we have over his entire career. 
Myers, on the other hand, if you look at the larger sample, typically this is a wide receiver that's below average when it comes to his touchdown rate. Now he was stuck in New England, so I'm not going to blame it on the guy. And I'm not going to say he's destined to have a lower touchdown rate than average forever. Oh no, of course he can revert to the mean. He can go back to average. So I think that's probably what's going to happen here. I think that you have some of these games where Jacoby Myers doesn't score the touchdown and he looks very mediocre. And maybe you're not necessarily looking at a mid wide receiver two and rather instead you're looking at a mid to low end wide receiver three. So if I could take Jacoby Myers and Jamison Williams and go out there and get a wide receiver like Chris Olave, like Jalen Waddle, some of those by low candidates we've been talking about for a while now, I think that that would make a lot of sense. Now, going over to a running back, Javante Williams is an RB that, yes, looked pretty damn good in a loss against the Chiefs his first week back from injury. And you would say, and I've seen in the live stream, oh, okay, yeah, a player their first week back from injury, they're only going to get better. I mean, Javante Williams already coming out 5.2 yards per carry. And let's pump the brakes a little bit. Let's look at the actual raw situation that Javante Williams finds himself in. Jaleel's played himself into a role in this offense. Uh, Javante's still the starter, that's for damn sure, but it looks like it's going to be a split backfield between Javante Williams, Jaleel, as well as Samaj P. Ryan. And ultimately, you can be a running back in a three man committee and still be effective in fantasy football. But you need one of two things to happen. You need either an elite level talent profile yourself where the efficiency will be through the roof. Or you need to be in a phenomenal offense. Now, if you're in both of those things, even if you're in a running back by committee, you are going to crush. Look at Raheem Boster. Look at Devon Achan this season. Where Javante's neither one of those. Javante really has never been efficient. Javante at the same time is in one of the worst offenses in the NFL in a three-man running back by committee. I personally am going to be projecting him out as a low-end RB3 rest of season. Not someone that I'm really excited about at all. Now, let's go over and talk about a New Orleans Saint. And I want to just say, it's very risky me doing this, okay? With the Saints playing on Thursday night, a lot of people are going to be watching this afterwards. And I mean, I can tell you right now, I'm going to be getting clowned on the comment section. But of course, real quick, before, if you're watching this before the Saints game, make sure you go take advantage of that Derek Carr special pick that they have tonight. More than less than half a total yard for Derek Carr on Underdog Fantasy if you are new. And also, if you're new and use promo code FLOCK, you are going to get a 100% deposit match and my rest of season fantasy football rankings and tiers. So please make sure you're taking advantage of that link in the comment section and the description. Plus that Derek Carr special pick of more than less than half a total yard. I love the Travis Etienne more than 60 and a half rushing yards for tonight. But if we're looking at Alvin Kamara here, this is a running back that has been dominant with volume. And you know, I'm the guy to say volume, volume, volume above all else. And Kamara's had 25 targets in three weeks. Absurd. Kamara's had 52 carries in three weeks. That is great. Now, with this workload, he's been one of the least efficient running backs in the NFL, which I actually think could get a little bit better. With his 25 targets, with his 23 receptions, the man has 86 receiving yards this season. Go through history and tell me how many players are able to average 3.7 not yards per carry, yards per carry, that's horrendous. Yards per receiving is a different level. So typically, this would be someone that I'd say, oh, okay, if the volume's gonna be there, I think he's actually probably gonna get a little more efficient and maybe he's gonna be a buy low candidate. And Kamara very well could go out there and absolutely crush over the next two weeks. My issue is, with Jamal Williams waiting in the wings, with Jamal Williams coming into this offense, what we may end up seeing for Kamara is he may end up transitioning more so just as that running back that's being used on third downs, as that running back that's a primary receiver, whereas Jamal's the first and second down option and Jamal's going to be more importantly getting every touch in the red zone. So that's my concern that we have with Kamara. And I've seen a lot of people really looking at Kamara as a low end RB1. So if I can pivot off Kamara, say if we can sell Kamara and Joe, I mean, get back Joe Mixon in a wide receiver upgrade, I think that would make sense. The only instance I would want to keep Kamara is if it's a full PBR format. Now, going over to George Pickens, he was a buy low guy for us back week one, coming off a 36-yard game against the 49ers. 
And Pickens has crushed it over the past four weeks. Pickens has had a 10 target game, six target game, seven target game, 10 target game. He's had two games with over under receiving yards. He's had two receiving touchdowns in that four game stretch as well. And George Pickens right now is a mid wide receiver too from a points per game perspective. But the issue is now we have Deontay Johnson coming back into this offense. And if we go through and look at the splits that we have with and without Deontay Johnson for George Pickens so far this season, games where you have no Deontay Johnson, George Pickens has averaged almost eight and a half targets per game. Whereas the games that Deontay Johnson has played, George Pickens has fallen from about 89 receiving yards per game down to 46. From about 8.25 targets per game down to about 5.11. His fantasy points from 16 and a half per game down to 9.73. It's a night and day difference. Deontay Johnson is a target hog. We also get Pat Frymuth back into this offense. So that's why I'm going to be projecting George Pickens going forward. More so as that wide receiver three rather than that mid wide receiver two. Now let's go over and look at DK Metcalf. With Metcalf, I just want to reiterate, you have Jackson Smith and Jigba expanding his role in Seattle. You have Tyler Lockett still as the number one target in Seattle. And on top of this with DK Metcalf, right now he is hanging on to barely being a top 24 wide receiver from a points per game perspective. If we go back and look at what you had with DK Metcalf last season, DK Metcalf was outside the top 24 wide receivers from a points per game perspective. If you look at what you had from DK Metcalf two seasons ago, DK Metcalf was outside the top 24 wide receivers from a points per game perspective. So through recent history for three years now, DK Metcalf has been a high end wide receiver three in fantasy. However, the perception of DK Metcalf, I see a lot of people in our live streams thinking that this is the same caliber player as a Chris Olave, as a Jalen Waddle. Hell, I would not even mind if you wanted to go out there, and I know this is going to sound crazy. I know people are going to hate us saying this, but hell, I'll give you a bold take every once in a while. I would rank Devonta Smith over DK Metcalf rest of season. I know DK Metcalf's big. He's strong. I wish I was him. But ultimately, he's just not a hyper-productive player from a fantasy perspective, year in and year out. And I want to take that perception. I want to instead pivot over to someone that's in a better offense with possibly less target competition. Now let's go over to Terry McLaurin. With McLaurin, this is another wide receiver that year in and year out, people get a little bit too excited about from a fantasy football perspective. I don't know if it's because of his rating on Madden. I don't know if it's because of his playing style where Terry McLaurin does not win with separation. I mean, you know, typically there are a lot of wide receivers that can win with separation. I mean, win with their route running ability and they just make a boring catch wide out in the open and then run 15 yards downfield and get tackled. That's not going to make ESPN. That's not going to make SportsCenter. Terry McLaurin, who doesn't win with separation and instead can just straight up moss any defender that he is on. That's what's going to go on the highlight reel. That's what's going to go on Twitter. That's what's going to go on SportsCenter. Well, now, I know that kind of skews the perception of Terry McLaurin, but ultimately with McLaurin, this is a wide receiver I want to reiterate and why we are not drafting him this season. He is 28 years old and he has never been inside the top 20 wide receivers from a points per game perspective, ever. With McLaurin coming off a very impressive game against Atlanta where he had 11 targets, he had 81 receiving yards. But Terry McLaurin so far this season has only had two games with 60 or more receiving yards. It's just all about trade perception of value where we can go through and maybe we can sell McLaurin and go get Devonta Smith versus the realistic production that we have seen year in and year out. I know everybody loves McLaurin, but the numbers do not lie. Are you with, I don't know who, he has never been a top 20 wide receiver from a points per game perspective, and he's 28 years old. Now, Kyron Williams is someone that I want to say, let's throw in the trade block with an asterisk. I am terrified to even mention the possibility of selling Kyron Williams, where Kyron Williams has been dominating. 158 rushing yards, the rushing touchdown this past week. Kyron Williams, seven touchdowns this season. Just absolutely absurd. The instance in which I would look to sell Kyron Williams, however, will be an instance where we're one and five, where we're two and four, 
and where you're telling me, Mason, I need points in this starting lineup right now. And then at that point, if you could sell Kyron Williams and maybe a smaller piece like Jamison Williams that we were talking about in this video, and we could go out and get a running back like Kenneth Walker, I think that would make a lot of sense. Because with Kyron, this ankle injury may end up opening the door, opening the window a bit for another running back in Los Angeles. I don't know who it would be. I mean, we'll figure it out together. But possibly making this a little bit more of a running back by committee. I'm not saying that Kyron Williams would lose his job outright. I just don't necessarily think that it's a guarantee that when he does come back from his injury, that he is locked and loaded at 20 touches every game. It's definitely a possibility, and it may be likely. But if we can sell him as if it's a certainty, especially on a losing team where we need points in right now, and go pivot to that guy like Kenneth Walker, I think that that would make a lot of sense. But I want to reiterate, you're not just selling Kyron Williams for anything. This is a great running back. He's been phenomenal. He's coming off 158-yard rushing game. So you are going to need a ton if we do look to move him. But I think that's all I have for this video. Again, thank you so much for checking it out. If you have not done so already, hit that like button. Subscribe to the channel if you play fantasy football. And if you wanted to check out any of those pickups, like I said, my favorite for tonight is going to be Travis Etienne for more than 60 and a half rushing yards. You can find that link to Underdog Fantasy, both in the comment section and the description. Promo code FLOCK, you're going to get a 100% deposit match, plus our rest of season fantasy football rankings and tiers. And on top of that, a Derek Carr special pickup, more than less than half a total yard. So please make sure to take advantage of that. But thank you again, ladies and gentlemen. I really do appreciate you. And really hope I get to see you in the live stream later tonight.